Evening all and uh, welcome along to the QMS session for the Sheep Breeders Roundtable. We are splitting this session this evening into two sessions tonight. So firstly, we'll be discussing terminal cell breeding, the role CT scanning has to play. Uh, this session will run for approximately 50 minutes before we have a short comfort break uh, before commencing the second session on marketing of stock during COVID and beyond. So we have a fantastic lineup of speakers um, this evening um, and I'll introduce them all to you as we go through, through tonight. Um, next slide, please. So um, just a, a reminder of tonight, the presentation will be recorded um, and it'll be available to watch via our uh, YouTube uh, channels afterwards. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, then pop them in the question box. Um, and if you can't see the question box, press the red, the red arrow on your right, the right hand side of your screen um, and it'll drop down there. So firstly, um, a quick outline of what we'll be covering this session. We have uh, the first session, we have three speakers. Um, I'll introduce them all to you shortly. Um, Nicola's going to cover what is CT scanning and how it's useful to readers. Then we're going to hear from two breeders this evening who are utilising the CT scanning unit, Irene Fowley and Scott Brown, um, and they're going to discuss it from their perspectives. Finally, we'll have a look into the future of CT scanning before opening up for questions. Um, and if you do have a question throughout the evening, then please put them in the question box and we'll try to answer them um, during the presentation or come back to it at the end. Um, so if we move on to some introductions. Uh, first of all, well, for those who don't know me, I'm Beth Alexander and I'll be chairing this evening. I'm a cattle and sheep specialist for QMS, so where I've worked for about two and a half years. I focus on efficiency of production throughout the supply chain and produce the QMS podcast. I'm also a beef and sheep farmer in Perthshire where I work alongside my grandparents, father and siblings to run 800 suckler cows and 1,500 yows. So our first speaker this evening is Dr. Nicola Lamb. Nicola has over 25 years experience working on sheep research projects, investigating improvements on carcass and meat quality alongside production and reproductive traits, considering both hill and terminal sire breeds. She currently manages the SRUC CT scanning unit, which quantifies a variety of important traits to, for use in research and commercial sheep breeding. Her recent projects have focused on measurement of and genetic selection for new traits, including methane emissions and feed efficiency. Irene Fowley is one of this evening's breeders. Irene farms in partnership with husband Jim. They have just over 2,000 acres, about one third animal, arable and the rest grassland. Fowley's finished 1,500 Aberdeen Angus cross cattle and have 200 Aberdeen Angus cross cows and finished their calves. Irene's main responsibility is 120 pedigree Suffolk yows. The flock was established 40 years ago and has been performance recording for 30 years. She sells shearlings and gimmers, mostly to commercial farmers, but also to pedigree flocks. The genetics from the flock are now in 15 countries across the globe, as well as throughout the UK. Last year, Irene sold 14 gimmers and three rams to Russia and semen from three uh, rams to the USA. And this year, they've sold semen to Canada and Hungary and exported 32 gimmers and four shearling rams to Georgia by air transport. Our second breeder tonight is Scott Brown, who runs the Capilla Suffolk flock with his brother Gavin, which was established in 1997. Their focus is very commercially driven, selling ram lambs at Kelso ram sales, which are performance recorded and CT scanned. The Capilla flock has also enjoyed great success in the show ring at national and local levels. In the past five years, they have exported Suffolk yow lambs to Spain, Portugal and Germany, and this year exported ram seed semen to Sweden and Norway. It's never been Scott's intention to chase the highest terminal sire index, rather to produce rams with great commercial appeal, backed up by desirable EBVs to match the requirements of their customers. 
Scott is also an, a regional advisor with Morden and works full time as an animal health advisor with Murray Farm Care at Dumfries Space Veterinary Pharmacy. So I'm sure uh, you'll all agree with me that we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers tonight. And I'll now hand over to Nicola um, to introduce the CT scanning. Thanks very much, Beth, and thanks for inviting me to talk this evening. Um, next slide, please. So CT scanning is a way of getting very detailed carcass measurements without slaughter. And we've been providing a CT scanning service from SRUC for the last 20 odd years. Um, and the traits that we've really been interested in since the start are to do with carcass composition. So looking at the total amount of lean muscle in the carcass, which we call CT lean, the total amount of fat in the carcass, CT fat, and a measure of the shape of the carcass, CT muscularity. <clears throat> and at the moment, that's measured in the hind leg. And you can see the picture with the red lines shows how that's measured. <clears throat> so since 2016, we've had a mobile CT scanner, which was partly funded by CL. And that's in the picture there. So we can expand our service and scan sheep throughout the UK. And it gives us very accurate predictions of these composition traits. So if we look at weights of fat, muscle and bone in the carcass, the accuracies are 90% um, thereabouts or over. And particularly for muscle and fat, the accuracies you can see there on the right hand side are 98% um, accuracy for muscle and 99% for fat. So we see those sorts of figures in all the breeds that we scan. Next slide, please. So to compare that to ultrasound scanning, you can see the pictures of ultrasound on the left compared to the pictures of CT on the right. Um, for ultrasound scanning, it's a one point measurement usually taken at the third lumbar vertebrae, and it measures the depth of fat and muscle underneath the scanning head. And it gives about 60% accuracy at estimating carcass fat and muscle weights, which is really quite good considering it's such a, a quick measurement on farm. So with the CT scanner, we can increase those accuracies to over 96% for um, carcass muscle and fat. And you can see the, the different um, accuracy in the images that we get. So a much clearer image and we can pick up a lot more information and we can quantify the information from the images that we get. Next slide, please. So it gives us more accurate phenotypes or measurements that we're taking on the animals. And this means that we get much more accurate EBVs as well for our carcass traits. So as I said, the composition accuracy increases from around 60% with ultrasound up to over 90% with CT. And the accuracies of the EBVs for fat weight, lean weight and muscularity have been shown to increase by about 5 to 13%. And this was some work that was done um, a few years ago by our colleagues in eGenes. And so this was comparing flocks who use ultrasound scanning only to those that use ultrasound plus CT. So we see that increase in accuracy of the EBVs produced within the farms that are, that are scanning using the CT scanner. And this also leads to an increase in the rates of genetic improvement or genetic gain on these farms. So for fat weight, lean weight and muscularity, those rates of genetic gain are increased by 7 to 20 percent um, in the flocks that are CT scanning. And as well, there's wider benefits for the whole breed within the breeding programme if some of the animals within the programme are being CT scanned. So it increases the accuracies and rates of genetic gain in all the relatives of those animals that are being CT scanned and also helps them build um, known genetic relationships between other traits. So that can help us to predict the fat weight, lean weight and muscularity in the animals that get some of these predictor traits measured but don't get CT measurements themselves. And some work that was done in New Zealand um, a number of years ago now um, to work out the most cost effective way of using CT scanning in terminal sire breeding programs suggested that it was most cost effective to scan between 10 and 20% of the ram lambs within the breeding program. 
And work that we've done at SRUC since then has confirmed that these numbers are, are right for the UK as well. Next slide, please. So this diagram just really explains about how we use that data um, that we measure with the CT scanner to produce EBVs and to give us accuracy values for those EBVs. So as well as depending on the LAM's own raw CT data, there's also information feeding into these breeding values from CT data measured on relatives and from other correlated traits like the ultrasound measurements that we're taking, uh, the measurements of growth and other traits, and also the pedigree information that's feeding into the genetic evaluations. And then we also know from previous research what the heritabilities of each of the traits are how they're genetically correlated or related to each other, and the, the size of the environmental effects and what effect they're all having on the measurements that we're taking. So putting all that information together in our genetic evaluations, we can produce EBVs and accuracies for each animal for their CT traits. But we can also um, estimate these EBVs for the related animals that aren't measured themselves using CT. Next slide, please. So I've shown a slide like this, a previous sheep breeders round table, and I thought we'd just update it with the latest figures. It shows a number of commercial lambs that have been scanned through the SRUC CT scanner since we started using it in the late 90s. And numbers have fluctuated a bit over the years, um, but we were getting around six or 700. Numbers were increasing up until 2019. But as you can see in 2020, when we had our COVID lockdowns, the numbers dropped away down to 120. Um, and that was across the different breeds. So there was some concern that we were losing genetic gain um, by having that year missed out. So it was only a few animals scanned really late in the season and would miss most of the scanning season by the time we were allowed to scan again. <clears throat> but having all that information from relatives across the different years um, and having that, that build up of CT information across the years before and after it means that we shouldn't lose too much information having had a lower number scanned in one year. Next slide, please. So as well as our composition and muscularity traits, in the last, I think, three years now, breeders have been given EBVs for a new suite of, of CT traits. So looking at spine traits, so the number and the length of the thoracic, number of vertebrae and the length of the vertebral regions in the thoracic and lumbar areas of the spine. Looking at the density of the, the muscle tissue can give us an indication of intramuscular fat as a meat quality predictor. And we can also now get measurements for loin muscularity as well as the the jigger or leg muscularity measurement that we had before. So these EBVs are now provided to the breeders alongside those composition EBVs. And again, that's for uh, the, the flocks that scan and all the, the relatives within the breeding program. Next slide, please. So the value of CT scanning is quite important. We, we can measure numerous phenotypes or measurements from one scanning session. So although it's fairly expensive to scan each animal, you're getting quite a lot of phenotypes for your money. So in terms of carcass quality, we can get measurements on composition, muscularity, and skeletal traits. Um, and we can also get this new measure of meat quality, which is the only accurate live lamb assessment of meat quality that we have. And then in the next part of the talk, I'll mention some new traits that we've been measuring, which aren't yet available as EBVs, but have potential for development. So um, traits linked to welfare of the animal and to methane emissions. We've also got the ability to go back and measure new traits from the images that we've saved from scan, scanning previous um, years. So we actually have thousands of images now, and including our research um, sheep that we've scanned, it's probably tens of thousands of images. So we can go back and measure new traits um, and then retrospectively assess changes over time in these traits. 
And most importantly, I think for Scott and Irene and the other breeders, it provides marketing material to prove the value of breeding stock. And so the breeders get raw data and scanning images for each of the sheep that they are scanning. And they're also provided with the EBVs and that's what they can use to, to market their stock. So I think that's all I've got to say at the moment. I'll hand back to, to Beth. Thanks, Nicola. We've just got one question for you that's come in there. Um, does CT scanning cause distress or compromises welfare for the lamb compared to ultrasound? Um, no, it doesn't appear to. I mean, there is some transport involved before the animals are scanned. So they're not generally scanned on their home farm, so they would be transported in a trailer. Um, but because we have the mobile scanner, that's reduced some of those journey times because um, we can take this trailer to somewhere closer. Um, they get a mild sedative, um, an injection of mild sedative before scanning, which just makes them slightly dopey and keeps them still so that we get very clear images. But once they've been scanned, they're just rolled out the crate and they stand up and start eating hay again. So um, I think the breeders that, that scan their sheep would agree that it, it doesn't really distress them in any way. I think Scott's got a video uh, later on as well, which will um, have a little bit, it'll show a small section of the CT scanning as well. So, uh, Thanks very much, Nicola. Um, we're going to hear from the breeders' perspective now that we've heard from, um, from the scanning unit. Uh, both Irene and Scott have been sc CT scanning for several years now, but they interestingly both use it in very different ways. Um, so if I get Irene back on, um, I'm going to get Irene to discuss uh, her, her perspective on it first. So Irene breeds Suffolk to sell shearling rams and gimmers, but no lambs. Um, can we get the next slide, please? Irene selects a range of lambs to be CT scanned each year. By selecting lambs from various families, she is able to use the data to inform breeding decisions and select maternal traits as well as terminal traits. So I'll hand over to Irene now to discuss how she uses her CT scanning results. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to share my experience with the use of CT scanning. I run the SD flock based in the northeast of Scotland. We currently run about 120 pedigree Suffolk ewes for the production of shearling rams and gimmers. We have a closed, very high health flock run on a grass fed system. The reason I began using CT scanning was to improve the genetics of my flock, especially for growth rate and muscularity. As a closed flock since 2011, I rely on finding the best genetics of the ram lambs born in my flock to continually improve the breeding potential of both the rams and the females which I sell, and also those females which I retain as replacements. I began using CT scanning in 2010, and perhaps coincidentally, we had the top UK Suffolk performance recorded ram lamb in 2011. I was persuaded by Arnold Park of Drinkstone, Suffolk and Texels that if I wanted to get a true accurate assessment of the breeding potential of my best ram lambs, I needed to use CT scanning as well as ultrasound scanning. Over the years, we've taken a total of 147 lambs to Edinburgh, to John and Kirsty, except none last year due to COVID restrictions. On average, we take about 14 or 15 every year, a comfortable fill of the trailer for the 350 mile round trip. Next slide, please. This slide shows the steady improvement of terminal sire index genetic trend for uh, our SA flock. And, uh, you can see the lambs, sires and dams. We've been able to maintain the steady improvement whilst at the same time growing the flock in numbers and including a small number of sheep with the New Zealand genetics, which came into the system at zero, although the semen I bought was from top recorded rams in New Zealand flocks. My method of selecting the lambs for CT scanning is quite important. After the ultrasound scanning, at about 16, 18 weeks old, 
Firstly, for CT scanning, we select the best grown lambs with overall good visual confirmation, length, tight skins, sound in legs and feet, correct teeth and testicles. Then we select high index lambs, both terminal and maternal, and lambs with good muscle depth relative to their weight. Then we select approximately 15 ram lambs from a range of the sires we've used. Once the CT scan results are factored in, I can select the best breeding lines from my flock from the breed evaluation results. Next slide, please. Over the years, the terminal sire index genetic trend has steadily improved. And this is a graph showing roughly what was on the last slide, just showing the steady improvement alongside the growth of the flock. We sell at Kelso Ram Sales and Dingmo Ram Sale, and also some private sales at home. We always display their performance uh, recorded cards, and I also make a catalogue with our performance details. The majority of my buyers, both new and repeat buyers, and some have been buying from us for over 25 years, rely on me to direct them to the rams which will best suit their needs. Some finish their lambs. Many sell the lambs store because of the nature of their land. And many also use our, lambs to, our rams to produce replacement females. By identifying the individual traits needed for their purpose, I can direct them to the suitable rams. However, the figures can only be used as a tool because the rams must always look the part. Over the years, the rams have been able to fulfill the buyer's needs, who are confident that I'm continually working on improving their breeding potential. And often, they don't make much effort to interpret the figures themselves. Next slide, please. We've supplied a shearling to Ram Compare every year for the five years of the initial project, and SE Suffolk have consistently done well throughout the project. In the 2020 analysis, an SE Ram, which had been CT scanned, was eighth in the leading ram for muscle depth DBB and fourth for fat depth DBB. This slide shows the overall results for 2016 to 2020, and an SE ram is fifth out of the 280 rams being tested in the project in the leading rams for muscle depth DBB. Although he was not CT scanned himself, his sire, uh, SE Ulysses, was. CD scanned with impressive jigget and CD lean ABVs. However, in my presentation for tonight, I discussed the topic with Ed at Signet, and he has pr produced some interesting slides to show the science behind the trust and loyalty of my repeat and new buyers that I'm always striving to improve our genetics. Next slide, please. This chart shows the trends in overall genetic merit for our lambs and the rest of the breed for the past 30 years. To begin with, our progress was consistent with the rest of the breed. Until 2000, we had been performance recording, including ultrasound scanning, but just within flock. And if you can see in the tiny writing, once we get to 2008, then the progress of our flock begins to increase when compared to the rest of the breed. This coincides more or less with a whole breed analysis becoming available when our flock genetics were compared to the whole breed in 2006. Once we get to 2011, a long wee bit, the year we started using CD scanning, the graph shows the next improvement. It explained that while the rest of the breed had been making steady progress from 100 to 150, my flock had trebled its genetic merit. He explains that the progress of our flock is down to two factors. The high rates of increase in the scan weight and muscle depth EBVs, and the progress of the flock has been making in the CT scan traits, such as jigged EBV and CT lean weight EBVs. Next slide, please. At the beginning, I said my aim for using CT scanning was to improve the genetics of, of our flock, especially for growth rate and muscularity. 
and that's what's on this slide here. If you look at the growth rate first, um, scan weight in blue on the graph. This slide shows that six to, since 2000, the breed has made steady progress in growth. The solid blue line shows a clear improvement when the weight of our lambs was being compared to others in the breed evaluation. And since 2011, when we started using CT scanning results, SF log has accelerated its progress in growth so that now an average SE lamb has the potential to be four kilos heavier at scanning than the average breed lamb. For muscle depth, that's a green line, it's a similar story except we made progress a bit sooner. Um, Ed explains that the rest of the breed had been limited in terms of their progress in terms of muscle depth on a weight adjusted system. However, the graph shows that since 2011 and using CD scanning, our flock made a great, great progress. And average SE lamb has a potential of almost two millimeters of muscle depth more than an average breed lamb. Uh, next slide, please. Now, does an extra vertebrae make a difference? And you'll remember that Nicola was talking about this, and I am totally indebted to Signet's explanation here. Um, this chart shows the live weight and the measured muscling in the lamb at CT scanning. It shows that as lambs get heavier, their weight of muscle increases. The main aim of this chart is to show the impact of the number of vertebrae has on the amount of muscle in the carcass. Lambs with 20 and 19 vertebrae have been plotted in different colours. I hope you can see that. Most of our lambs of 20 vertebrae, sheep with a higher number of vertebrae, tend to have a higher yield of muscle at any given weight. And all the lambs with highest proportion of muscling also have 20 vertebrae. And from the table, we can also see that lambs with highest spine number are longer and heavier at the same age. So selecting sheep with more vertebrae and a longer spine helps to increase their muscling in the carcass. Now, this is the case in our flock, but it can't, could vary in different flocks or breeds. Next slide, please. Finally, on a more practical note, I had an interesting experience with our CT scanning this year. Although we did the CT scanning the week immediately after the ultrasound scanning, the effect of the CT scanning did not appear immediately on the evaluation. The breeding merit. For, our terminal, for the terminal index of two lambs, in particular, proved, uh, improved very noticeably once the C CD scan results were factored in. And I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of them, because after the scanning, they were turned out to the grass until we needed them at sto uh, for stock rams. But this is the photo of two of my stock rams immediately after shearing. And their lambs are now doing very well in the USA as well as in our flock. And the twin brother of the ram on the right went to Russia. So the story about the CT scan of two ram lambs this year. SA Phantom had a terminal index of 440 before CT scanning, and this improved to 460. This is an impressive score because 333 is the goal for top 1% Suffolk terminal index. This can be partly attributed to an impressive CT lean weight, CT muscularity, CT eye muscle area, and CT jigget score. However, SE Fitzroy had a terminal score of 420 before CT scanning, and this improved to 478. And at the moment, he's a top registered Suffolk Ram Lamb for 2021. And this again is attributed to uh, an impressive CT lean weight, CT muscularity, CT eye muscle area, and a massive CT jigget. So looking ahead, I believe the future of the success of our flock will depend on selecting the sheep, both male and female, with the best physical attributes combined with top genetic merit. I intend to continue with my high health program on a grass-based system. But the profitability of my buyers is essential, whether they are producing finished or stored lambs or replacement females. I find that by running a closed flock as a terminal index improves, so does the maternal index. In conclusion, I believe that the progress of our flock 
can be directly linked to our use of CT scanning. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Uh, just while you're still here, we've got one a question coming for you as well. Has the use of CT data changed the look of the RAMs you're producing at all? Has it changed the the look of the RAMs you're producing? No, because um, I'm very conscious of only selecting the lambs we like the look of before we even go to CT scanning. So I only take the ones that have the right um, confirmation and appearance before we even go to the CT scanning. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, go on to Scott now and get Scott's perspective. So Scott breeds Suffolk to sell as lambs, um, largely at Kelso top sales each year. From the ultrasound scanning at 21 weeks of age, Scott selects the top performing lambs to go to the CT scanning unit. This is so we can use uh, the results to find USPs for individual lambs. Scott's found this helps to translate the data for his customers. So I'll hand over to Scott now. Thanks very much, Beth. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, many thanks for the invitation to present to you this evening. Um, we began recording Suffolk uh, five years ago, which is very much born out of necessity um, due to the reduced demand of, of uh, lambs, very much a, an issue across all beads, I think, now. much more, Many more people now just want to come and buy a shearling and take it home and, and uh, throw it out with the ewes and forget about it. So lambs are definitely becoming a little more unappealing to, to purchase for rams. Um, and we decided if we were going to be able to, to uh, still sell lambs in 15 to 20 years' time, we were probably going to have to future-proof um, the Suffolk flock we have and create some sort of a USP for our rams. And uh, today we're the only pen of Suffolk lambs sold at Kelso Ram Sales, which are CT scanned. For us, um, performance recording was about uh, gaining greater transparency within our flock and uh, being able to signpost customers as opposed to the elite lambs that we have within our flock. Um, slide number one, please. Um, our focus is, is, uh, is not about uh, chasing the highest terminal sire of our, of our maternal index or maternal index. It is, however, very much about producing sheep with physical appeal and matching that up with credible EV, EBVs and marrying the best of, of both worlds, I suppose, if you like. Um, slide number two. Um, performance recording produces just so much data um, for us to use as, as breeders and uh, breeders of rams. And I see our role as, as breeders as being very much a linchpin in between the data that's produced and, and, and fed to us uh, by the likes of Signet and the commercial sheep producers who come to the, to, in our case, Kelso Ram Sales to buy our rams. And our job, I see it as our job, is very much to pluck the gems of information that come forward, the, the key uh, gems that uh, are in there, which sometimes can be uh, muddied a little bit in all the information that we've got available at our disposal and uh, match it with match those gems with the shopping list of buyers who come to Kelso on the ram sale day to, to buy our rams. And now uh, Malcolm Stewart from the Sandy Now Suffolk Flock, I think Malcolm's listening in tonight. Malcolm and I had a conversation about this very point and we both agreed that when you're selling at sales, you probably got about 30 seconds when somebody's at your pen to engage with them, establish what they want and match them with what you've got. Um, and I think by, by doing our homework beforehand, uh, we can, uh, as, as breeders, we can very much uh, do that quickly and, uh, and get people what they want. Uh, next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, CT scanning very much maps out how we present our sheep to potential buyers and existing customers. Um, and you can see in these images that we write on our cattle, a blank cattle tag, which we put in a red ribbon and hang around the, the necks of our rams uh, on sale day at Kelso. If nothing else, it becomes a talking point. Um, so people come along and say, what's that? What's the ribbon and, and what's the thing hanging on your tup's neck? So it gives you an opportunity to engage with them. It's a little bit quirky, I suppose, in actually what, um, what we're looking at. So I have to thank Sam Boone and uh, John Gordon from the CT Scanning uh, Unit for these images because these guys come to the pen and, and take some, some images for themselves. And uh, I've shamelessly 
uh, borrow that material back. <laughs> and as you can see on, on the one on the left, uh, this one here, is, I've got the top jiggit score and the longest spinal length. That was actually the ram lamb you saw in the previous uh, image, which was our top price lamb at Kelso in 2019. Um, and you'll see the other points that are there, they're available. Now, these are, these are the points which I call as real currency. These are, these are gems that I can strip out of the CT scanning results and tee up to farmers and match with them what they're looking for. For example, the longest spinal length, the top jiggit score, the highest killing out percentage, the highest intramuscular fat percentage, and I'll come to that in a second, the highest percentage of muscle in the carcass for those who, people who are just looking for that meat yield uh, and carcass weight. And um, all, the, all of the above are as real currency, as I said, that buyers engage in and can relate to, and, and actually in our case, uh, connect with and, and uh, put their money down to buy, to buy a rams on the back of that information that's offered up. Uh, interestingly, in 2019, we had a, a family from the northeast of northwest of England who have a very successful Wagyu retail business. And they have their own Wagyu cattle and they retail Wagyu beef very well. They've also got a flock of sheep on their farm. And they wanted to roll that success story into their sheep flock as well. So they came all the way to phone me beforehand. They came all the way to Kelso on the morning of the sale, literally about 15 minutes before we went into the ring. They just said, Scott, which number is the ram with the highest intramuscular fat score? Pointed the ram out. They came to the ring, bought them, took the ram home, and that, and that was it, and uh, got on fantastically well. And they've been supplying half a dozen butchers in, the, in that uh, northwest corner. And um, that all those all those key points that they bought the ram for have come through into the into the, the carcass and have actually been a, um, an added value product for the butchers as well, which is great. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, the lamb we had this year with the highest muscle in the carcass was actually our second uh, top price this year at Kelso. For, he was £1,000. Um, I'm not sure he'd have been £1,000, if I'm honest, um, if, uh, if, he hadn't, uh, if he hadn't been CT scanned, but he was very much, I know one person was very much um, after him on that, on that basis. Now, you'll have also seen on, um, on Irene's uh, presentation, there was a graph about vertebrae and the association of, of vertebrae length or number of vertebrae with, with, uh, with weight. Uh, the longest spinal length with 21 vertebrae is very pertinent to our breed, the suffix of which many of them have, um, has a great retail advantage to, to butchers. And uh, Anthony Glaives, a friend of ours and also an award-winning butcher of Glaives Butchers in, in Yorkshire, um, commented that 21 vertebrae allows them to get a second crown roast out of uh, each side of the carcass, which is worth an extra £9.10 um, to, the, to the butcher shop. And he says, in many cases at the moment, there's not £9.10 worth of margin involved in a whole lamb carcass. So something like that is extremely important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in 2017, we sold um, 18 ram lambs at Kelso. Um, 10 of these ram lambs were CT scanned and eight of them were not CT scanned. The 10 lambs which were CT scanned averaged £260 per head more than the non-CT scan lamb. So I think all things being equal, that's a pretty good return on a £60 CT scan, I would say. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is an image, um, the CT scan image um, of a loin scan of a ram, which we sold in 2016. Um, I invited two local butchers that day, uh, uh, husband and wife, Michael and Louise Forsyth, who we supply with lamb on occasions, to come and see the CT scanning process. And it actually turned out to be the best hour and a half I spent with a technician in the CT unit and uh, a butcher um, looking at uh, CT scans. It was really educational. Now, it's a little bit um, Tony Hart, the, the writing I've put on this, so please excuse the, the lack of uh, detail and attention to detail. Um, but for those of you less familiar with what a CT scan looks like and, and the images you're looking at, if you're looking at the, the ram, the lamb is actually upside down. I've pointed out the eye muscle and I was also pointed out the marbling, which you can vaguely see strands of running through the eye muscle on the carcass. But quite important in this image is the fillet. Now, when this lamb was going through the scanner, Mike Versailles said, can you stop the scanner? He said, look at the amount of fillet on the inside of the vertebrae on that lamb. Um, now, when previously, when we've been ultrasound scanning, you're scanning from the top of the, of the, the ram down to the vertebrae, to the rib. We're not actually measuring, because we can't see it, we're not actually measuring the fillet area, which you now see pointed out in the CT scan. And this is also uh, currency and also um, gives our buyers confidence when they can see that sort of level of uh, detail as well that will ultimately come through into the carcass. 
Um, so um, I think perhaps, I'm not sure if I managed to load it up, but we've possibly got a video to play now, which is was created for the Suffolk Sheep Society uh, called Farmgate to Plate. Okay, so the sound's not coming through on this, but this is Mike Forsyth of Forsyth Butchers and Peebles. Uh, butchers uh, over three generations uh, in Peebles. And they source um, locally produced beef and lamb in the Scottish borders. They're great supporters of the of Suffolk lambs um, because they value the repeat business they get on the USPs of the breed. Mike came and saw our lambs being scanned as the uh, video shows at the CT scanning use at the bush. Um, scanning unit at the Bush Estate and uh, this is John Gordon preparing a lamb to go in to be scanned and as um, you've heard already in, in the Irene and Nicola's uh, presentations the CT scanning gives us um, things like carcass length, killing a percentage and um, percentage muscle fat and intramuscular fat in the carcass. This is the scan that I just showed you earlier on, this was the scan of the ram that Mike was really taken with and it was just so happened this this um, this ram was used, was bought by Alan Smiley from Peebles, who supplies Mike's um, shop with lamb. So Alan put um, this particular Suffolk ram in, in lamb, to, uh, put 20, 50 texture cross mules in lamb for this ram. And uh, we cut the, the, the loin section through just exactly where the, the scan was done, as you can see side by side here. And very much all the properties that were, were impressive on the day of the scan came right through into the next generation, which um, there was four grown men high-fiving themselves, each other, and uh, in the butcher shop through the back. That's a good job nobody saw us. But it was a great exercise and did give me, as, a, as somebody who CT scans, real confidence that it does make a difference to do it and identify that because it's, um, it's an added, added selling a USP to, to people who buy it and use it. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Looking to the future, um, undoubtedly lamb will be sought after in the same way that beef, uh, the beef where, as, where a premium is paid for a, a good eating, eating experience uh, for lamb with a high intramuscular fat score. And globally at the moment, there's some very good examples uh, of that um, lamb pro Australia being a very good example of, of just how successful that's actually been. And as Nicola said earlier in her presentation, the CT scanning is the only live form of quality meat assessment that we have at our disposal. So at the end of the day, why not use something as valuable as that? As an industry, I think we need to look at, uh, to harness the very real potential that we have in our UK sheep flock and get paid for a premium for the producing um, lamb, which will deliver a good eating experience, more than just chasing the grading system at the moment, which you get paid for an E or U grade carcass, which doesn't always transfer into a good eating experience, as we know from taste tests that have been done on various occasions. But achieving this requires um, more breeders to CT scan uh, the rams. We only had, as you saw on Nicola's uh, table, we only had 406 ram lambs were CT scanned in the UK this year, not all, of course, of which were of uh, in high intramuscular fat scores. So before we can really get too excited about supplying major retailers with, um, with a high, high eating quality lamb, we're going to need more bums on seats, folks, and more of you to embrace perhaps CT scanning and uh, get that real population and percentage of, of rams out there with a high intramuscular fat score. Now, the ram you see pictured in front of you on the, on the presentation is a homebred ram called Capula Mr. Marvellous. He's one of our stock sires that we use here at home. Um, his intramuscular fat score, the year he was CT scanned in 2018, he was the sixth highest intramuscular fat CT, um, CT scan um, in the UK that year and somebody's already ahead of the game um, he's just been sold to a breeding company uh, we're looking to produce rams with high levels of intramuscular fat and their uh, their uh, potential or what he envisages them doing is selling high intramuscular fat rams into into Europe for specific jobs so thank you very much um, for your time ladies and gentlemen I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations this evening and if you have any questions I look forward to taking them Thank you, Scott. I think that video that um, that Robert Smith created for the Suffolk Society is brilliant. It really demonstrates uh, the wider benefits of CT scanning uh, from breeder all the way through to the end product as well. So um, that leads us on quite well to Nicola Lamb is going to come back on and going to discuss the future developments 
um, of CT scanning. Thanks, Beth. Um, so if we go to the next slide, one of the new traits that we've looked at, which I touched on earlier, um, is Lamingese predictors. Um, so this is really came from the breeders that had been coming to CT scanning. A few of them had asked, was there anything that we could measure when the animals are being CT scanned that could predict Lamingese in the progeny of the rams that are being scanned or in their daughter's progeny? Um, so we've taken some measurements and gone back and and measured these in the archived images that we have from CT scanning previous generations and then linked that up with the Lamingese scores that are in the database. Um, so Lamingese predictors that we've been measuring are um, those to do with the, the body dimensions, so shoulder width and hip width and also the dimensions of the pelvic area. So looking at the pelvic opening, we can um, manipulate the images to see the pelvic opening, and we can measure the height and width and area of the pelvic opening. And another measurement we've taken is pelvic angle, as we've called it. So the angle between the spine and the pelvis, um, because some people had said that those that are difficult to lamb tend to have a pelvis that lies closer to the, the spine and not so perpendicular to the spine. So ideally we wanted to take measurements that we could measure in sires uh, during routine CT scanning for the breeding programs that would be able to predict the lambing ease of their progeny or their daughter's progeny. So we worked with a data set from Texels, which is our biggest data set that we had, and they also had lambing ease scores as well. So my colleague Anne McLaren did some genetic analysis of this data set and she found that the, the traits that we'd measured were quite highly heritable. Um, so the heritabilities are shown in the table there. So between 40 and nearly 70 percent heritable for the different traits. And then when she looked at the relationships of these traits with lambing difficulty scores, she found that when we looked at the trait of lambing difficulty as a trait of the, the progeny of these sires, so their lambs, there was a, an association between lambing difficulty and an increase in shoulder width and hip width. And then when we linked it to the lambing difficulty of their daughters when they gave birth, we found that there was a, a those that had more difficult lambings were those that had smaller pelvic widths areas and a lower pelvic angle. So there were, were um, real relationships seen there between the lambing ease scores and the, the pelvic predictors and the width predictors from, measured from CT. Next slide, please. And these are just some results from one of our honours projects, um, to our honours students last year who did a project on some of the CT data that we had in store. So Kirsty and John measured these um, Lamingese predictors from CT scans of the three main terminal sire breeds uh, with the highest number of um, CT records. So the Charlie, Suffolk and Texels and compared them all at a fixed live weight. Um, so three of the traits shown here, the top left shows shoulder width, and this shows that the Texels had a, a broader shoulder at the same uh, live weight. The top right is pelvic area, so the Suffolk's had the highest pelvic area at the same live weight. And the bottom graph shows pelvic angle, with the Charolais having the highest pelvic angle, which um, is related to easier um, lambing. So if we go on to the next slide. Another of the new traits that we've been looking at with our Scottish Government funded research is to try and find a predictor of methane. And the um, interest in this really came from some research that had been done in Australia and New Zealand, and they'd um, CT scanned sheep that had been selected for high or low methane emissions. So they had divergent lines of sheep that had been selected for methane emissions. 
and they found that those with the lower methane emissions had smaller reticulorumen volumes. Um, so we wanted to kind of turn this on its head and see if we measured um, rumen volumes by CT scanning, and then we put those animals into methane chambers, would we see a difference in the amount of methane that they produced? And the study that we did was with Scottish blackface ewes, and the graph there on the, the bottom left shows the relationship we found. So we did see that positive relationship between rumen volume and methane emissions. So we look back at our archive data from one of our research projects where we'd had two different breeds, um, divergent breeds, so Scottish blackface and Texel. I'm not sure if you can see the labels on the, the graph at the bottom there, but the green bar is from the Scottish blackface and the yellow bar is from the Texels. And these lambs were all grazed together from birth to slaughter on low ground pasture. So they were grazed as one flock with exactly the same diet. But when they were CT scanned, we found that the same live weight or at the same age, the, the Scottish blackface had much larger rumen volumes. So at the same live weight, it was 26% higher than the rumen volumes of the Texels. We've also done some genetic analysis in Texels um, to look at the genetic control of rumen volume. And that's another trait that we've found high heritabilities of about 0.5. So this is potentially something that we want to look at in more detail because it seems to be something that we can measure from our routine CT scans. So the genetic analysis we did was on the Texel data that we'd collected during the, the routine scanning for the, the national breeding programs. So potentially this is something that we could, we could look into breeding for in future if that was appropriate. Next slide, please. And this is something that we're looking at further in another European project that we've got going at the moment. So SRUC is the UK partner, along with the Texel Sheep Society, and there's another six countries involved. And we're looking at two traits, so feed efficiency and methane emissions, and looking at the re relationships between those traits um, outdoors and indoors, and the relationships between the two different systems. And the aim is really to look at genetic and genomic control of these traits and whether we could breed for improved feed efficiency and reduced methane emissions. Next slide, please. So this is our feed and tape recording equipment that we have at SRUC, um, which was funded by CL. And it works with the EID tags in the sheep's ear. So every time an animal goes in for a feed, it records the amount of feed eaten and you can work out um, individual animals' daily feed intake, as well as looking at things like the number of meals and the duration of meals. So we can get really good information on the feeding behaviour and the feed intake of individual animals. Next slide, please. And in that project, we're also um, working with other partners which are taking measurements of methane directly using portable accumulation chambers. So some of these pictures are from Uruguay, some from Norway, uh, some from Ireland, some from New Zealand. Um, and there, some of them are also measuring feed intake as well to look at those relationships. Um, and ourselves and um, France are also looking at room and volumes by CT scanning to relate to these traits as well. SRUC have ordered portable accumulation chambers with um, funding from UKRI, which should arrive next summer. So we'll be able to take some um, methane measurements ourselves um, from next year onwards. Next slide, please. So the last thing I just wanted to mention was some advances in the way that we're analysing our CT images. Um, so this is some work that we've been doing with our colleagues from eGenes. So um, James Robson, who works in eGenes, has been looking at ways of using machine or deep learning techniques to take all the huge amount of information that we get from CT scanning and to try and automatically take some of these measurements. Because at the moment, when we're doing our rumen volumes, Kirsty and John can measure about 20 or 25 lambs per day. 
So even though the scanning is quick, the image analysis for some of these traits is very slow. So trying to find ways of automating that process is, is really key to, to increasing the efficiency of the CT service as well, especially for some of these new traits. Next slide, please. So just want to thank you for your attention and also to thank Kirsty and John, who are the ones who do all the scanning and the image analysis um, and give me something to talk about. And also thanks to our funders and those that provided data. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicola. I think there's loads of exciting research happening and, and um, the way it'll inform in the years to come. It'll be really interesting. Uh, we've had quite a few questions come in, so we're just going to open up uh, to questions for all panellists. Now, um, first one for uh, Nicola. Going uh, right back to the start of the, the it's just the CT scanning. Uh, what EBV index is used? Is it specific to the CT or specific breed EBVs? Um, so if I understand correctly, the, the, there's EBVs for CT fat, CT lean and muscularity. Um, and those are produced from the combined breed analysis. Um, but as far as I'm aware, they're compatible with, within breed. Um, and we also then have the new EBVs. So there's the, uh, the spine length EBV, so for the thoracic and lumbar regions, there's a vertebrate number for the same two regions. Um, and then there's the intramuscular fat EBV and the eye muscle area. Does that okay. answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, um, and to Irene and Scott, what is uh, your feeding regime or attitude to concentrate feeding and how has it changed, if at all, over the years? I'll come to you first, Irene, and then I'll come to Scott after. I think you're still on mute, Irene. There you go. Oh. We're still not hearing you. I'll come to Scott first and then we'll come back to you, okay? Uh, thanks, Beth. That's quite an easy one, really. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's quite an easy one, really. Yeah, uh, we put a herbal lay in about um, three years ago with a view to reducing uh, concentrate inclusion for rams. I'm never, a big, I'm never a big believer in pushing rams too hard to the point of sale. Um, I've seen the downside to that in my previous employment working for the uh, Brit Breed where fertility has been affected by overfeeding in rams. So that's another subject. Um, so uh, I reckon I cut my concentrate inclusion out by about 25% by using the herbal lay. Um, and I, my school of thought there as well is um, if our rams are produced on, on predominantly a grass-based system, hopefully their offspring are going to be um, pre-programmed as well, that they'll perform well off a grass-based system as well. Come back to you, Irene. Can we hear you now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. At, um, at about eight weeks, the lambs are introduced to a creep feed. Um, and because we believe that uh, at that early age, that's the most efficient time to uh, use any feed. But as soon as they're weaned, they don't see any concentrated feed at all uh, for the next 12 months. We have them on grass. I'm lucky that once the cattle are uh, either sold fat or in for the winter. I have got a lot of grass around the farm that I can just move them. I just move my sheep around all the grass fields and it usually lasts out till the spring when the grass grows again. So it, they do get uh, mineral buckets all winter, but they see no feed until about, well, the rams get a little bit of feed before they go to sale because um, they do need a little bit extra, but what we do do is grow a special grass mix and they go on to that as soon as the grass is growing in the spring, uh, chicory and clover, and we feel that that helps them a lot just to bring the, them into bloom for sale. And uh, gimmers don't get any grass, any feed. The first feed that any uh, of the gimmers get is six weeks before lambing. Thank you both. Um, another one for Ian Scott. As a commercial lamb producer, um, 
we want that lambs are easily finished from forage. Uh, how do Scott and Irene consider fat covers identified by CT scanning? Are you breeding for less fat cover, which could mean lambs are harder to finish? I think a really good question for Irene, actually, because you're selling a lot to commercial flocks, aren't you? Yes, yes, we're selling to a lot of commercial flocks. A lot of our commercial flocks actually um, are on hill and less favoured areas. So they're looking mostly for growth, the great growth potential, um, because obviously the better, the, the better grown they are at a store sale, the better for them. And they unfortunately don't get the benefit of the confirmation, but presumably the buyers, uh, their, their buyers will be loyal and come back if they've done well for them. Um, what we find is that um, with the changes in various uh, the calculations, we used to uh, score over fat and now we tend to be slightly leaner. But the good news is it means that they can grow their lambs to that slightly higher weight without getting over fat. So that seems to benefit the, the, the buyers. Scott, what's your take on fat cover? Yes, I must. I mean, we've signet to their credit have changed the weightings on fat um, in about the sort of early 2000s where there was a massive drive to lean meat, lean meat production and a lot of the lambs that were actually thriving really well were laying a bit extra fat down they were being heavily penalised. So that's that's uh, been weighted away from that now, which is even better because it means we're now selecting towards animals that carry a bit extra fat and if they're doing it off grass, even better still. That's great. A uh, question for Nicola. Um, are the pelvic areas live weight adjusted? They are very high, and was this a surprise? The pelvic areas, so, so at the moment we've just done our genetic parameters for the pelvic areas, um, that was live weight adjusted. Um, yeah, yeah, live weight at, C, at the time of CT, um, that the heritabilities are high yes is that right yes they are high um it wasn't really that surprising because bone traits tend to be high we were more surprised by the spine traits that were lower than we'd hoped they would be but most bone traits in, in other species have tended to have high heritabilities um so for example the spine traits in pigs i think were about 0 0.5 0 0.6 so we were hoping that we would get similar heritabilities for our spine traits in lambs which were lower than we expected so yeah it's quite, it's quite good that these um, pelvic traits have higher heritabilities. And another one uh, for Nicola, going to the looking at the methane emissions and rumen size, are smaller rumens and sheep, is there a link between larger rumens and sheep that traditionally graze on hill or poor ground as opposed to breeds more likely to be fed concentrates? or a higher quality grass. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that I think we really have to consider before we go down any routes of selecting for room and size. Um, we saw that with the Scottish blackface and the Texas, even though they'd been grazed on the same low ground pastures, the blackies had much larger rumens. And I think that's just the way they've um, evolved or been naturally selected to be able to graze these poor quality vegetation um, areas on the hill. So what we don't want to do is select these types of animals for smaller rumens and make them into monogastrics really and not ruminants um, because that's the, the beauty of these breeds is that they can live off land that's not suitable for any other production. So yeah, it's a real trade-off that we have to consider in our breeding. Yeah. Um, and we'll take one final question before we just pause for a quick um, break before the second session. Um, is Nicola, is the objective to have a methane output EBV? If so, will growth rate be taken into account? Yes. Um, yeah, so having some sort of methane um output ebv would as the ultimate aim um potentially through these pack chambers that we would get but if the rumen volume is a very good proxy then perhaps we can use that as a, an easier measurement to to take to to predict it uh, yes it would have to be some sort of uh, adjusted for 
live weight are included in an index alongside live weight as well. Um, similar to feed efficiency as well, um, that would have to be relative to, to live weight and there's lots of different ways that you can you can account for that in, in the index. Yeah, and um, I know Scott and Irene are both very interested in all the work that's going on and if there was an area for CT scanning uh, to go, I'm sure they would say all the things above. So um, have you got any final comments from from Scott first? Uh, well, yeah, I think I think the uh, well the methane one's obviously very topical, but I think the the one the one big advantage of uh, some of the new traits is going to be uh, pelvic width and and uh, angle etc. Because that's going to be a a game changer for a lot of maternal breeds. Um, if, if people that is if the breeds embrace that uh, that opportunity and, and start CT scanning. And Irene. Well, yes, I would agree about the pelvic one, but we have to remember that, you know, well, what I'm finding is that some of the terminal terminal breeds are also being used, well, especially the Suffolk's are being used more as Suffolk cross females and being well accepted um, over a number of different uh, native breeds. So that it, um, it it's very useful in a terminal breed as well. Um, and I take Nicola's point that we must be very careful when we're measuring methane um, and the fact that some breeds are so well adapted to eating um, forage, we must be very careful not to eliminate that advantage since grass does sequest carbon dioxide, which is obviously even more damaging than the methane. So it needs to be a balanced approach, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all uh, to Nicola, Scott and Irene for uh, a really good uh, session um, on CT scanning and lots of exciting research going on. Um, we are uh, getting shorter time, so we're just going to go straight on through to the next session. Um, and if we've not come to your questions, I apologise. We'll try to come back to you uh, in writing. Um, but if I can now bring on John and Neil. Um, great, so our second session is focusing on the marketing of sheep during COVID and beyond. Uh, so joining us tonight, we have John Scott and Neil McGowan, two uh, very well known faces in the, the sheep sector. Um, so to, a reminder to anyone that might have missed us at the start, the session is being recorded and will be available. And all, also a reminder um, to any registered um, sheep advisors to uh, confirm your attendance to Carrie Ann. Um, and I've popped a, the, her email in the chat so you can confirm that. Um, so again, if you've got any questions, pop them in the question box throughout and we'll try to come to you um, as well. So for the second session, we're going to hear from our two breeders on why they market stock differently, how does it work, what works and what doesn't work, and tips for farmers um, before coming to some questions again at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, skip two slides, please. <laughs> That's great then. Uh, so firstly, just a quick overview of the routes to, uh, to market we as farmers have available. We obviously still have the live auction ring, which plays an instrumental part in the sheep sector across the UK. COVID-19 saw the markets and auctioneers have to adapt quite significantly to keep stock moving off farms. Kelso Ram sales, one of the most recognised multi-breed sales in the country, in a normal year, sees 20 breed sections across 15 rings. However, coronavirus halted that for 2020. But I'm sure many were glad to see it back with such great trade this year. With this, we saw a large increase in remote and online sales, which was a first for many buyers and sellers. The auctioneer also does a lot of field work um, as the middleman between seller and buyer. And then obviously we can also sell direct. So whether that be store producer to finisher, tops from reader to commercial flops, 
or finish stock to the abattoir. Ultimately, it all falls down to what suits your business. And that leads on, us on to our two speakers this evening who have both adapted how they sell their stock in recent years. Um, so to introduce our two speakers tonight, uh, first of all, we've got John Scott. John is a fourth generation farmer who farms in Easter Roths with his wife, Fiona, and their four children. The business has enterprises over various units, including renewables, malting barley, three and a half thousand breeding yows, and 250 beef cows selling genetics and high quality Scots lamb and beef to various outlets. Included in the livestock numbers are stud cattle and sheep enterprises, with beef, shorthorn and lings being produced, along with Texel, Aberfields, New Zealand Suffolk and Beltex rams, which are sold at online sales in August and January each year. John is a Nuffield Scholar, winner of the Murray Trust Future Farmer Award in 2013 and Farmers Weekly Sheep Farmer of the Year in 2014 and in 2017 was awarded Highlands and Islands Food and Drink Ambassador. He's also an associate member of Royal Agricultural Societies and in the past has been a board member for Quality Meat Scotland, chair of the Scottish Sheep Strategy Group, the Scottish Sheep Sector Review and is current president of Ross Sutherland Rug uh, Rugby Club and chair of Farmstrong Scotland. Um, our second speaker this evening is Neil McGowan. Neil and Debbie run Inchich, a family farm in Perthshire, along with Neil's parents and sister, where the business is based around a herd of 220 suckler cows and 1,200 yows. All breeding stock are pedigree and performance recorded, but run on a very commercial basis. Breeds are Clins, Texels, Ling, Simmental and Angus. The working genes sale a ram sale has sold their entire ram offering for 14 years, growing from 50 rams to 100 rams, joined by around 20 bulls over the last four, four years. Neil claims the working gene sale was born on a, a very long bus journey in the Australian outback when he was travelling in his 20s. He had seen how ram breeders spoke about clients rather than punters and how that was a better fit than what he had, with what he had learned about marketing in his degree course. It just took a while to get the product, the market and a bit of courage and the push from Debbie to get it started. Um, so now I'll open up to our two breeders. First of all, um, John, can we start with you and why have you started marketing stock differently? Our um, evening guys, our penny drop moment came 10 years ago when we were selling performance recorded Texel Rams in Dingwall um, a local market centre. Um, and we were on in the morning and our sheep where we felt um, fit and good figures, suitable for the, the job. And it was a sunny day and we were, sorry, we were on in the afternoon. By the time it got to two o'clock when we were on, everybody had gone home um, to combine. So we've been thinking about it and we thought, right, we'll go on farm. And we went on farm with a conventional lock stone farm with the mark doing it for several years. Um, and of course, you know what happened with COVID. We had to look at different options. And we always had half an eye on doing things slightly differently. Um, and, and Neil and I both came to the same system, the Helmsman style um, Eurobit auction, uh, developed in New Zealand through a different, a different way, if you like. I met the Giddings, I was driving. Um, along going to a wedding in New Zealand in 2019 and saw some nice Angus cattle at the side of the road and hit the brakes as you do and got cursed up by Fiona because we were late for this wedding. But anyway, we went and spent a bit of time looking at these cattle and it wasn't until much later that we, we got in touch again with the, the Giddings when they developed, um, due to COVID, this online selling um, system. I think for us, we're really keen to produce sheep in a, in a natural way as possible. So grass and forage based, um, we don't feed our rams any concentrates at all in the winter they're on uh, forage and, and hay um, and we just try to produce a product that will go and do a job for people won't fade away we often get um, people not complaining but suggesting that that sheep won't come to the box so they have to train them to, to eat concentrated feed um, and we want them to go on and grow when they go to their, their new homes um, and i think by taking it things in control under our control if you like um we can just get a better relationship with the consumer um and not the punter so we, we develop a really strong relationship with that 
our buyers and, and make sure what we're producing for them works. And, and yeah, no, it's worked really well so far. And, and, and the, the Eurobid system was the next step. We'll just talk about how that works in a wee while, but um, I'm not sure, Neil, you want to add anything to, to that or um, how you market stuff differently? Oh, the way we uh, started really was it was John Bypon's fault, I think. We he ran a sheep group in, uh, oh, I guess, uh, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, going along to these meetings, every every meeting, the discussion seemed to end with things were the ram breeder's fault and we weren't doing things correctly. And um, I, I, I just uh, I just came home and thought, you know, what you know, what would happen if we tried to do everything right for a ram sale? And uh, that sort of brought in thinking about uh, biosecurity. Um, the, the selection of the sheep was, um, you know, a, a big part of that. And and then uh, trying to bring out rams to sell without any concentrate feed was um, was kind of the last step um, that we thought would be a point of difference for us. And and that was uh, the start of. Uh, of of trying to uh, sell sheep differently, but without feed, I think you yeah, really had to take the uh, take the sheep away from the collective sale and just show them on their own, and and that was the how we how we ended up with an on farm sale. We went for an evening sale that might have attracted folk that were uh, maybe working, and I've always liked the idea of a helmsman system. Um, which was uh, supposed to be the most fair way for people to um, to, to, to buy a ram or a bull, um, but it was uh, uh, I, I couldn't really get that across to the rest of the team. So um, when we were forced to go online uh, last year, um, I, I was keen to, um, to to go with this uh, the the Eurobid system that uh, let us uh, try that helmsman system, and it's been it's been really useful. It's been very quick sell a lot of rams in a short amount of time and it's useful it's really good for for busy people folk that are on the combine or uh, uh, on a fishing boat or on an oil rig i think we had this time um, you know folk that are a bit of a distance one of the things that for us based where we are is that um you know neil's north but we're 40 miles north of Renes, which is really north and it's opened up the whole of UK and we've had sheep, we've had cattle going to Southern Ireland and sheep and cattle going to the north. Um, and we wouldn't have that market if we didn't have an online system. Um, and I think for us, we obviously we'll talk, we've talked about auctioneers earlier and you know, we try to take the auctioneers with us. That, um, we do offer a commission if auctioneers bring buyers to the sale. So it's, it's important that you know they're still in the mix if they want to be. Um, and I think by having an on-farm sale. It's about creating that event, creating an atmosphere where people can come. Um, we're not expecting everybody, we don't want everybody to stay at home and bid on their computers or on their combines or on their phones. There's not much crack in that. We want people to come to the farms and be there, be part of the day, view the sheep, get the crack, speak to the sponsors, and then bid on their phones. Or, or if they're not, people aren't comfortable with the technology, they just hand in a bidding slip at the bidding stations. And it, it goes fairly smoothly. We've had a question here. Uh, can Neil explain what the helmsman system system is? Uh, well, it's quite difficult. <laughs> it just means that all all lots are all lots are live until the end of the sale. So you can go either forward or backwards in the catalogue until the till the sale's finished. Um, uh, I saw a helmsman system operating. Um, in uh, in Iowa, in the United States, selling bulls, and the the thing it was run on the back of a cornflake box. There was uh, there was uh, phone numbers and prices uh, written on the back of a cornflake box, and, and it, uh, you know it seemed to work that way. Um, uh, and uh, the, the 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 online one is a wee bit more technical than that, and it just uh, the, the, it's you know it's the same principle. It's real yep. difficult to understand. <laughs> <laughs> John's going to explain well, it in the video just in a minute. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, we'll We've got a couple of videos. More minute, I think, yeah. And Neil, you started this, well, you, you did a Nuffield Scholar on um, a large list is what, what informed a lot of the way that you do things now. So do you want to talk through your Nuffield Scholar? 
that'd be fine. Yeah, um, I was lucky to get a Raffield scholarship uh, about six years ago, and I visited a lot of uh, breeders um, across the world and, and who, who ran sales, bull and ram sales. And I thought maybe I could share a wee bit of that with you. If we, can we go on to the next slide, please? Um, one of the places I've visited was uh, was Kelso, the she a sheep operation in um, in New Zealand. And um, I, I just was just going to, um, I thought it was a, a really good example of running a sale. And um, and I was just going to run through what happened. Um, so on the day in question here, where we were, um, where there was, uh, I think there was four or five clients coming. And uh, some of the rams were brought into the, the, the shed for them to see. And um, so this was just a, the, the rams coming in, in in the morning. And if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, buyers were invited to um, to come and and pick the, the the rams they wanted. This fella Matt here was um, he'd, he'd ordered thirteen rams, so he got to look at fifty rams to, to pick the, the ones he was looking for. Um, we're in a wool shed here, and you might notice a CT image in the background. Um, just a bit of promotional stuff. Um, that was so. Matt was uh, picking out. Uh, this was a, a picture of him visually, just picking out some of the some rams to look at further. And we go on to the next slide, please. Once he'd taken a pick of maybe twenty rams, um, this uh, this old fella here was uh, running his magic wand over them and um, uh, reading the EIDs. And we go on to the next slide. There. Um, the the rams that had been selected then Matt uh, on the right is uh, 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 pulled the the EBVs off these uh, selected rams up and uh, we had a discussion about what uh, uh, what the the the, the particular um, needs were in these rams so if we go on to the next slide um, the, the big screen was able to we were able to um, rank the rams in either index order or um, or, or, or whatever trait was uh, was deemed the most important um, you know whether it was a uh, litter size or, or eight week weight or whatever um, usually that meant after that drawing out three or four of the bottom bottom rams and and, and looking at the rest and then next slide and uh, that was at the end of the day with his, his selection of rams and um, there was there was plenty of help from there and next slide and uh, that was uh, well, one of these pictures is uh, his rams and another picture just uh, some of the Kelso rams getting getting loaded and yeah and a, a bit of a view around the place I said I could use these um I would use these Slides, if I if 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 if, the, if I I could use the slides as long as I, I got to wear a cap. But um, anyway, headphones don't allow that. So um, <laughs> Matt went away with uh, with a cap as well, and uh, and, and uh, that was that was that. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll maybe just uh, look over some of the things that uh, really took me from that that sale. And I, I thought what was um, what was important about the sale was it was you know it was or the, it was very business like and professional. You know, there was there was uh, genetic trend graphs on the, the the display. It was a well-run, tidy farm, um, and 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 it just had a look of a a, a general look of a a, a a job done right. Um, and there was it was innovative. There was clever use of uh, of the the EID and the the, the wand and the, the the EBVs and the big screen. And uh, bear in mind, this was six years ago before uh, before we knew how to work these things. Um, it was a comfortable environment, uh, and I think that's something. Uh, uh, we, when people arrived, you could see they were a little bit on edge. But as soon as you got into the sheep yards up in the wool shed, folk just relaxed, and uh, you could you could just see they were a lot happier. And I think that's uh, you know it's something. And now when uh, markets are often big, uh, cold, uh, concrete places, and um, um, it's good to to help people relax a wee bit. Um, it was relaxed. Uh, nobody was pushed for time or rushed, and there was a lot of confidence in the bidder. Um, uh, 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 Matt, the, the 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 guy that ran the sale, ran the, the breeding program, 
was, was available and could, could fully explain any of the EBVs and it was able to, to answer any questions. There was a, a quite a nice social time involved with it as well. There was time for a cup of tea and a chat outside. And uh, there was a bit of help at hand. There was a kind of, the, the, the old guy there with a the wand was a kind of semi-independent fella and would obviously work around sheep all his days. And uh, uh, quite a few of the buyers sort of looked to him sometimes to, to ask him, oh, what, you know, I don't know what ones to pull out. What one would you pull out next? And and it, it would maybe just give a give a helping hand to help select. And that kind of um, helped with the confidence in the buyer a little bit. And it was a very inclusive sort of thing. Everyone left with a branded cap or a T-shirt or something. And, and it gave the impression that you were joining a successful team. And I, 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 I learned a lot from my trip to, to Kelso. And I, I just thought I would maybe use this opportunity to share that. That's excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Neil. So on you go, John. Yeah, to follow on from that that learning experience, I remember being in Australia and speaking to a guy there who sold 800 uh, Merino rams a year, and he wouldn't sell a ram to anyone unless he or one of his representatives had visited the farm to ensure that he, they had a good understanding of where these sheep were going to work and how, how and what were the requirements of the the buyer were. So I think that's another you know, Neil's touched on there with an understanding our buyer's requirements to be able to um, speak to them and in a comfortable environment, as Neil said again, is, is key to this. And that's I think what we're moving on to now, Ben, is, is actually how does it work? And how that, um, how does sale day work? How is it to build up for an online sale? Is that right, Ben, ben you want to move on a slide? Yeah, um, yeah, so if we go on to the next slide, it's you've done the why and um, the reasons that you came to this, but it's actually then the, the preparation that goes into it. Um, and the actual functionality of the sale day. So, uh, John, on you go. Yes. Yeah, so, assuming the sheep are right and we, we keep an eye on them and keep feet right and on a grass rotation, preparation for sale day is very much office based. Um, so, there's that shoulder there, Emily, at the at her desk there this year, um, creating the sale site, putting all the data in, putting sensible reserves in there that we feel. So, for example, we think a ram is worth 600, we put a, a one bid below that. So, as soon as it, it's bid on, it'll, it'll be a live bid. Um, and we would have a, the sale open for 10 days before. Um, and what we found last year is that there was quite a bit of activity. People were getting used to the system um, and placing bids as a demonstration part where you can place bids and not get landed with anything. Um, and last year, people were, you know, the, well, they were COVID and they were, they were they were at home and they were looking for things to do and they were on and they were using the system. But this year was much later. Um, last year, by the Thursday night before the Friday sale, uh, we had 80% of rams that hit you know, the price that we thought they should be at or more. And it, it was, it was a, a great way of going into sale day that we knew that our rams were going to be sold. So on sale day, um, as you can see here by this picture, that's the shed where we, we pen all the rams up. We would have only had one or two viewing days um, in the weeks before that so that people can't come to the actual sale they would come and have a look um, we've got big screens up there was one on the right hand side there this year we had quite a lot more um, so that people can, can see and follow the sale and basically people are on their phones they're or they're handing a bidding slip in and they're watching these screens wherever they might be um, and they can see when their bid is on and they can see when somebody bids against them and every time a bid is placed it's like the ting and a and the bell at the hotel um, and Neil and I have that noise ringing in our ears for, for days if not weeks after the sale, it gets quite exciting. Um, and the whole sale finishes when there's two minutes without a bid. Um, so we're aiming for three, we were aiming for three o'clock finish and as you got to three o'clock it really got pretty exciting and by this year by half past three, quarter four, um, you know, there were no bids and we, we finished the sale. And Neil said this year, and he'll maybe talk about it. We had um, had somebody there as a, a bit like a Sky Sports presenter. presenter. So, so talking about um, talking about the sheep, you know, if the sheep hasn't got a, a bit on it, maybe go and um, mention some of the good attributes of it. And I think um, in terms of innovation, we're, we're tweaking and 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 moulding this this concept as we go. And and, and what what works, what doesn't work, and, and just always moving and changing. Um, but 
the bottom line is the product's got to be right um, and you've got to create that comfortable environment for people to come along so we have a, a, a laminate spit and um, we have a beer if people are driving um, and you know we just make people feel at home uh, we do have sponsors in as well um, who want to get involved and they appreciate that environment as well and that um, they can get involved in something and, and and they do business, you know, they get um, business from being involved um, with the sale. Neil, what have I missed in terms of how it actually works? I think uh, just from a buyer's point of view, you're, you can either bid on the phone or you can bid on a, a, a tablet or something at, at, the, at the event or, or not at the event. We've also got guys that bid by just uh, just waving at the, the 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 folk on the computers, and uh, much very like a, a normal auction. But I think maybe the best example I can uh, describe for just you know uh, describing the, the the helmsman system, or the you know the the was was probably um, a buyer from last year who, who, who came and saw the rams and picked two. Two rams that he liked, and he ended up being pretty pretty deep in in on a, a sheep uh, lot twenty eight, and uh, and then he kind of took a pull to himself and thought actually you know the the two rams there was very little between the two rams, and he ended up buying lot twenty one for less than half the price. So you know he's he's he was delighted about that, but it it does mean you can if you if a ram's gone through the ring. Um, is uh, you can still go back to them till the end of the sale. It's probably quite a good time to show um, the video. Of actually, show we've got a video from Neil's working jeans sale on um, the kind of setup uh, on the on the day. Uh, there's no sound in this video as well, but it is just music. So <laughs> we'll let Neil do a little bit of commentary where he sees fit over this. Did we? We, we pen the rams up as usual, um, just like we did when we ran a, a, a live auction. So we are looking across some of the uh, textile rams here. Um, I thought it was quite good in the catching gates, actually, Neil. I thought they were good. You can see it here. I uh, have learnt a bit, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, just the uh, fairly big pens so folk can see, um, uh, see the sheep from a distance a wee bit. Um, we did, uh, even though the sheep weren't auctioned, uh, with an auctioneer this time, we we did still run them through the ring so that people could get a, just a better look at the sheep on their feet. And uh, we did, uh, although we didn't uh, use it, an auctioneer in, this, in, in, in the in the traditional sense, we did have uh, an auction company involved with the with the sale. Graham Burks there um, mm -hmm. giving us some chat on these sheep, running through the ring, and uh, you get an idea of uh, some of the people that were here. Um, this was uh, the, so the, the bidding was open at this point, and there was some bids on these rams. But uh, the bidding, um, the, the, the 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 real bidding process um, really happens just as uh, as it starts to close. So a lot of people here just marking down um, rams they were they like to the look off. And uh, I think this is maybe the the, the, the barbecue shed. Um, so we have uh, we had big screens up around the the the, the steading. The orange uh, highlights there are uh, new bids on display. And um, we do have uh, we try and put on a little bit of hospitality and uh, cakes and uh, such like. And then um, here was the the the, the final closing and the sale. Um, it was quite a different atmosphere. People were um, um, quietly watching the screen and and bidding on their devices or uh, or to 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 Debbie and the girls on the computers. And it was all uh, fairly low key and relaxed. And I think that was that. The whistle stopped too. It wasn't quite as quick on the day, wasn't you? <laughs> no, but. Uh, we used to spend two hours putting sheep around the ring, and uh, that was quite a hard job for me to do. Just uh, I, I lost a bit of sweat then, usually holding these sheep in the ring and and, and walking them through. And, and and I think there was probably a time limit on how many sheep we could sell 
um, through through the ring because of that. And uh, this year, my job was very stress free. Um, Debbie's was not. Um, hers uh, was uh, she had uh, um, there was quite a lot of uh, work her, her way, but we we could uh, the whole thing took uh, much less time. Um, I think our first people arrived about two o'clock. Some of them didn't stay for the sale; they bid from home. And uh, the last person left about seven o'clock, and that was it. Was quite a lot shorter than uh, than a normal sale, and the last couple of hours were uh, uh, were, were spent mostly drinking beer. So. That's great. And um, so, in terms of what works and what doesn't, is what learning points have you taken from the last uh, sev several years of doing this? Neil, and you go. Oh, um, uh, I think what works, I've got uh, uh, getting to know your customers, solving problems when they occur, because they do, and you just need to, need to solve them for people. Um, a good sale day welcome and a bit of fun. Um, and uh, being really honest with your appraisals and uh, I think that's quite. I think we're selling more sheep without them being seen, and if if you're uh, if you're brutally honest with uh, with what you say to folk, uh, they genuinely have a bit more trust in what you're going to do. Because uh, I think everybody accepts that no ram's perfect, so you need to to tell folk what these faults are too. Uh, videos have been a great thing. I think you know a photograph can. Uh, it's difficult to get a good photograph. It's very easy to get a bad photograph, but a, a video gives a true reflection of what the animal looks like. So we've done a bit of that. And we've tried to, I think, keep the auction companies involved to, to sh try and show a bit of transparency in what we're doing as well. I think that's basically it. John? Yeah, I mean, it's a very fair and transparent system. Um, when you hit the button at the end of the sale, um, you close the sale, all the names come up, and everybody can see who the various different numbers were. You know, what number, a buyer number 100 might have been creating a bit of excitement because he's a, having a ding dong battle with number 120. And it's, where are they? Uh, at the end of the sale, you put it up. Um, yeah, much of what Neil said in terms of what works, I think um, having a good product from start and calling hard throughout uh, until you get to sale day, we have a vet inspection of all our rams. And, she's pretty hard and there'll be things that that we kill that um yeah could make a ram but try to keep the bar as high as we can i think engaging the next generation is starting to work for both myself and neil and getting kids involved a part of the process um and that also works for buyers in that if you've got maybe uh, someone that's not so tech savvy and maybe not comfortable buying on the, on the phone they might bring along grandchild, for example, and get them involved. So there's an opportunity there to engage that next generation uh, in the technical side of it. And you know, it'd be pretty cool if your, your grandfather couldn't work the phone and you went along with them and, and did the bidding. Um, we've talked a lot about, about looking after people and creating that culture and that, that experience coming to the farm. When the pickup was driving out of the farm and there were a couple of kids in a, in a booster seat in the back of the pickup, you make sure those kids get an ice cream. That's 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 one of the, the key things for us in making that experience. So let them get the sugar fix and, and um they'll be back again, they'll be pesting the parents to come back again. Um back up after the sale, making sure the sheep get to their destination and making sure as Neil says, if there's a problem, because you will get problems, you just fix it. Um and, and don't muck around, just fix it. And in terms of what doesn't work, there'll be things that you've tried and maybe wouldn't try again and uh, well, COVID-19 has been the biggest learning experience for the whole sector and for across across sectors as well. Has there been learnings from that too? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll continue to get learnings. I think we were both pretty nervous going into year two that with um, greater accessibility to normal sales, how would our sales stand up? And, and we were very happy with both the prices and the clearance rates. Um, so that, that has worked. Um, as Neil said, we're, we're, we're keen to engage auctioneers. I'm not sure that's worked so far for us. We have offered a percentage if they bring buyers to the sale. That's still there. We 
the door is open to, to keep involving them and in, in New Zealand agents, as they're called, they would be quite involved in these sales. Yeah. So yeah, there's maybe work to, to do there because we don't want to, to cut them out of the loop altogether. We want them to be involved in a different way. And uh, what didn't work was, uh, you know, don't sell a lamb you wouldn't be happy buying, I think, maybe. Um, uh, I don't think there's much we didn't that we tried last year that we wouldn't try again, I think. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot of things we have tried to, to do again. Uh, we really missed seeing the people. Um, but um, and, and, and I guess you can you can spend a lot of time. Uh, I guess that's maybe something we did change uh, from last year. We had uh, we had we spent about two weeks looking at rams every day with people, people and that was quite hard going um, on uh, the rest of the team at home here and uh, the rest of the farm probably, and it was pretty hard going in the sheep as well. And uh, uh, this year we tried to condense that into two or three days when uh, people could come beforehand and look at the sheep. Um, and that was maybe one thing that. I would have been. Otherwise, what didn't work was uh, well, yeah, trying to keep the best back for another sale. You know, if if people are coming to the farm to to to, to look at your stock and, and buy, I think you've got to be respectful of that and and offer them a fair deal and offer them all that you have. Um, and and that's really, I guess, what their, our sale was about. It was we won't sell anything before the sale, um, and and. You know, so everybody gets first pick. And have you had feedback from buyers, and has that helped you alter your systems as well? Yeah, it's not some. It's not suited everybody. Um, um, uh, some I've got a buyer that really doesn't like it at all, but he did come back and he. Did end up having to use the system, and he did actually buy. He did get the two rams that he wanted, and he did actually pay less. And, so um, yeah. I still don't think he's happy, but um, uh, but it's not going to suit everybody. And uh, but most folk are pretty happy with it. And from the, the first year in coronavirus, well, the first year that you, that you went to the European system, it was almost forced. You maybe would have gone that direction as well, but you really did have to go fully online. So it was a big change. And then from the first year to the second year, do you think people have been more adaptive to it? I, I don't think, I don't know, Neil, what you think, but I don't know if, if we hadn't had COVID, did that, that, has that been the cat? That was the catalyst. And I'm not sure if we would have taken the plunge without it. And, and I, would really question whether our buyers would have come with us without it. I think they had to have that year of buying online. Um, and as I said, we were nervous going back to going to it again and would it work again? But I think now our buyers, we've got a lot of buyers that haven't got the time to come and spend round ram sales or or, or or bull sales for that matter. And, and I think I read an article once in the Scottish Farmer about um, somebody writing about the the biggest decision is actually by deciding where you're buying your stock from, um, not the actual RAM. So you know, like to think if people come to us, they decide to come to us and they want to buy Texel Tup. We've got 30 or 40 Texel Tups that do their job. And um, you know, once they've made that first decision, it's really then most of the sheep will do the our Texels are most of like Neil's, they're all high index, um, they'll do a job. It's actually coming here is the big, the most important decision. About where you buy your stock or, or to and that leads us on really quite well to marketing. And Neil mentioned videos before and how important they are. Um, John, do you want to mention because you really you use the pre-sale videos a lot, don't you? Yeah, I suppose our time where in years gone by, we might be spending time dressing sheep and getting sheep prepared for sale. We don't touch them at all now, and that. But it was a lot of preparation in terms of getting the shed ready, which needs to clean out anyway before harvest, um, and then setting a ring up and running, running sheep through a ring. And um, we use Anne McPherson comes and does our video for us. So she does the edit as well, which is, which is handy. You know, you do two things yourself, which probably involves quite a lot more work, but we've subbed that out. Um, 
and then just making sure it's on online and in terms of marketing you're still drained as you would be after a, a conventional sale you're drained because you're you're on twitter facebook um uh, whatsapp phone calls emails um I've, some of the james my oldest does a bit of the, the online stuff but it's mostly me and you're just you're glued to your phone in that lead up to the sale um and you, you're you're pretty tired by the end of it but you have to do it and you have to keep doing it and promoting what you're doing and um going out there and doing a, a bit of a video live on facebook things like that just to keep driving the interest to the sale and keeping people aware that it's happening yeah and i've got a video to show and um, from you in a second john and neil have you got anything to add before we show that video oh um no go for the video yeah go for the video if we can get the video then carry on Again, there won't be any uh, sound of it, it's just music, but uh, I'm sure John will do a bit of commentary where required. Yeah, it's, it's a pity we haven't got sound. This is, uh, for those of you of my vintage, it's uh, uh, the soundtrack is Airwolf, um, the old series there. But as you can see, you know, tips are as they are, blood on the head and everything, unfortunately. And um, this is them just in the lead up to the sale. Uh, we spent a bit of time getting numbers and everything, and uh, this video was done by Anna, just it was something a little bit different. She was spent a bit of time getting to go in a circle with the dogs, Freddie and his dogs. Um, but yeah, just presented numbers on, um, out through the ring and, and videos um, individually so that people can um, look at them on YouTube. Um, not putting them in too big a run on YouTube so that if people want to look at, for example, just the texels, they're in lots of 10 or, or, or not many more and they can go through them. and. And, and see the tips they want, go back and forth and compare. Um, last year we did it with commentary, or this year we did it with um, music. I, I do like the commentary, I think um, it's good, and Neil had commentary with his this year, but it's, we just found that my chat for that number of sheep was maybe getting a wee bit boring. And, um, we'll maybe look at that again, that's something to look at. We also had gimmers at the sale, um, so videos with them, and. Um, yeah, they went all over the, the country as well um, to repeat buyers and um, yeah, that's it. Uh, back to the Rams, I think it finishes off uh, a bit of chat about dogs as well. Um, we're lucky to be able to have, you know, professionals like this we can um, call upon to come and help us do this job. And um, I suppose our commission that we would be saving by using the conventional system um, is getting spent in different ways so it's getting spent on marketing um but a little bit of humor here with the dogs at the end from on just to yeah I, I have a different angle um i think the other thing, thing too if you can tie in other aspects of your business for example we've got holiday cottages if we can tie in and we're doing that with the, the cattle sale we've got coming up and we'll try and because it's in january it's a quiet time year we'll try and um you know, drive a bit of business that way. So if you have got something else going on the farm you can link into, um, it's worth looking at that. And um, we've got quite a few questions coming in, but the the main theme through the question is if all breeders wanted to went went this way, would it become a diluted market and they wouldn't be successful? I <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think breeders have breed different types of sheep and different ways of doing it. I think um, there's certainly room for more people doing it, um, but you've got to be confident in your in your product and want to do it and actually be consistent in what you're doing in terms of the, your approach and the, the backup you're providing and what your your offer is. Um, yeah, it's not for everyone. If you've got 20 taps to sell in a year, it's maybe not, not for you, but it's maybe something that could be done collectively in different areas uh, if people wanted to. For example, you could have a viewing day that went round um, different farms, and then you maybe go to the local hotel and have the, the, the buying, the, the sale part on the screen there and finish with a meal. Uh, I'm not sure what you think, Neil. Yeah, it's, uh, you're probably right. And um, I, I it was a big decision for us to take the bulls, um, take the bulls on to the to to, to, to on farm 
because it's um uh we we really like uh we like we get a lot of fun out of taking uh, bulls down to the Sterling Bull sales in Castle Douglas and uh it's it was a, that was quite a hard decision to make. But I think you know we were, it was we were gonna do it this way with the Rams. I think we needed to do that. Um, that's it. That's it. Sorry, Andy. Go. And and a day down at Kelso this year, um, trying to buy it well buying Rams um, was, uh, you know, it's, it's great fun and what a what a place to sell sheep. Um, it's yeah, it's not for everybody, but it's uh, it, it's it's working for us. And, and with, I, I guess I guess you need to find your market and and the people you want to sell to and. Uh, and uh, and focus on 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 them. Um, somebody told me once that uh, you know uh, take a look at your take a look at your customers, the guys that you're selling to, and uh, and, and and you know um, look at the, look at the ones that are still going to be there in ten years' time, and and, and build your build what you're doing round 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 them. And uh, I think that's that's maybe helped us uh, guide what we're doing. A little bit. That's excellent advice. And um, you know, I love going to Kelso. I love the challenge going and trying to find um, something at an auction. It can be a poultry auction, anything. I just enjoy going to auctions. But I don't enjoy standing in the ring selling. I, I find the pressure of that and I get pretty stressed with that. But when it's my own environment and the, the sheep are on farm and I can talk one to one with the buyers and really um, understand their needs. Um, that's different. That, that's for me. That there's a real buzz doing that. And we've had a, a comment come in here as well. There's many different ways to buy uh, to buy and source sheep, but uh, it's the professionalism and the after sales support that you both offer that has been highlighted as being key. And um, that's why you've had success with them. Um, I'm sure you many would agree as well. And um, I've got a logistical question as well here. If people are bidding from home, when do they collect rams, or are they delivered? Uh, just a comment on the professional side of thing. I think we should remind ourselves that we are professionals. You know, we as farmers, are, as sheep farmers, are professionals. Don't do ourselves a disservice and forget that. Um, our rams uh, um, go off. Uh, we try to get in the way of the week, week ten days after the sale, and we've got lorries going in different directions. Or stock trailers going in different directions, and we get them away fairly quickly. We've got a couple of stragglers every year, same guys every year, um, that they, they, they're there a bit longer. We try and encourage them to go quite quickly because um, the, the sooner they get to the their new home and adapt to that environment, and um, the better, really. Um, but obviously, you, you can't just snap your fingers and get sheep to Shetland or the Western Isles. You've got to tie in with, with transport. Yeah, we've ended up. Over the last two years, uh, delivering quite a lot of rams, and that has been uh, an insight into seeing where they're going as well. And I think that's uh, been a good thing, but it's uh, it's taken a lot of time. Uh, um, and just one other thing about the you know the 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 system probably, um, I think that you know the system, the sale days, that's it's just sale day, like the sale, and 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 what it is itself, it, it, it's about the. It's 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 a lot more than that, really. It's you know it's the breeding program, it's the service and the backup, and it's it's the flock health, and it's about you know the sort of the, the breeder integrity, and 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 all that. That 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 this this that's what the sale is. The the system of selling is just about sorting out who gets what ram. But that, that's it's, it's sort of it's the end. It's, it's the end thing. It's it's all the bits we do beforehand that that, that makes the sale. I think. Absolutely. And if, a question uh, from a smaller breeder. You're both of sell, and you've got the volume to the to sell on the day of your sale. How would you suggest smaller breeders sell grass-fed rams without the use of markets? I think collectively, um, teaming up with other breeders of not necessarily the same breed, but in the same area, and trying to encourage and, and spending time and getting a bit of a a round tour, if you like, tap tour uh, around that area and, and do it that way. Uh, with, a, with a system like this would be what I might suggest. And also, I mean, Facebook, Facebook on its own or, or social media on its own is pretty powerful um, in terms of selling things. Um, if you can, um, 
manage it. Neil? Uh, we, we probably don't have enough bulls for a bull sale and uh, we're, we're giving it a go and, and seeing how it works and it's uh, we're, we're getting some sold so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a challenge but I think uh, unless you give it a go you won't know and uh, a final question for tonight do you think this sort of marketing is something that could be used for um other produce well other stock rather than just pedigree or uh, rams bulls how do, how do you see it evolving yeah, yeah, yeah no i think there's huge potential if you can sell anything to it um you know we're doing a setting a few sales up over here and we've got a, a, a charity option to do in it um in a couple of weeks time i think um yeah you, there's no reason why we couldn't be doing anything through the system. Um, it, it, it lends itself really well to stud sales to individual animals, but we could do groups as well. We did that with Gimmers. Um, it, it's it's about how we set up the um, the collecting of the money. The, who does if you're doing it on a bigger scale? Who does all the videos? To try and get a little, a little bit of consistency into that. And if if other businesses are setting that are doing a sale like Neil does, you know they have to take that that social media responsibility on and actually run with that. So maybe in time, that's something that we built in and offered as a service as well. But um, that personal touch with social media that makes a difference, I think it's, it's quite important. Yeah, I think, I don't think you need to have the volume of people there to make the sale using the online system and, and and so i guess that ties in with the smaller breeder thing as well you don't have to have um a, a sort of critical mass to make it work i think uh, george in, in new zealand had a house on it did he not i think he sold the house the other day yeah he sold the house yeah. so it really can the the options are are they <laughs> Um, well, that's great. Thank you to both John and Neil and the speakers from the earlier session, Irene, uh, Scott and Nicola. It's been a really great night um, speaking to everybody um, and a little reminder of what's left to come as part of the Sheep Breeders Roundtable Conference Week. Um, tomorrow night we'll be hearing from Ag Research, uh, Future Proofing Your Sheep Business and then the final session on Friday lunchtime at 12 breeding sheep for the future. Um, so on behalf of KMS, thank you for joining us this evening and we hope to see many of you in person back in the, the real life Sheep Breeders Roundtable Conference um, next year, hopefully. So thank you all.